Yeah, so I'm uh, Charles Forsyth. Uh, I've got a, a company called, uh, one of the founding uh, directors of a company called Beta Nova, based in York, and we were doing a lot of work with um, you know, very early distributed systems. Um, Bell Labs came out with Plan 9. Uh, that was under a restricted license. Um, but I got some friends interested, and we formed the company. Um, and later, they Bell Labs came out with another operating system called Inferno. Um, and in a roundabout sort of way, we ended up acquiring that from Lucent um, and looking after it for a good many years. Um, lastly, uh, um, open source being what it is, um, I've been doing uh, um, contracting um, uh, for partly because uh, for tax reasons and uh, um, uh, because it gives me a bit more flexibility from uh, doing things within the company. Uh, nevertheless, the company is still there, and both Plan 9 and Inferno are still there and they're being used. Um, the systems, so because the systems are yeah, slightly, yeah, so the structure is something like this. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the systems, very brief information mm -hmm. in the background because I might otherwise run out of time. I'm then going to focus on the, th the aspect of the system that encourages us still to use it despite you know, practical problems that get in the way, uh, such as having to write device drivers, having to interface with things, um, having to make do without a whole host of ready-made software that you get free of charge with, with all these other systems. Nevertheless, we still persist in doing things with it, and others do too. Not very many, but enough uh, that I've been able to, to work pretty much full-time for um, well over a decade. Um, uh, doing things with just these systems for the most part, and occasionally dipping for commercial reasons into other systems and, and then retreating in, in, in some pain. Um, because uh, you know, when I was much younger, I did a lot of work with Unix uh, when the alternative was a big, complicated, bloated, horrendous system, and used Unix because it was lean and interesting and mean and, and, and small and easily understandable. You could change any bits of it, and it was great. And latterly, um, uh, some of these other so not the ones that have been described tonight, because they've obviously people have gone to the effort of, of making them lean enough to work uh, uh, while still not losing the advantages um, of, of having access to a lot of software. Erlang, for example, would be a good example of, of something you might want to lose. But in the system, uh, it's just you know, not currently available. Um, nevertheless, th there is an aspect of the system which has encouraged us to continue to use it um, and to build applications and appliances and other things using it. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'll go back if there's a bit of time left and perhaps mention a few of the things, practical things to do with tool chains and other stuff. But um, I suspect I'll probably run out of time. Now, I mentioned I've been working in this area for using these systems for a couple of decades now. I um, started using them at the University of York when I was still working there. Um, and one of the side effects is that I spent so much time in that that, that, that I, as these other systems have evolved and changed and added complexity upon complexity, and th there's a whole host of things that I just never use uh, in these systems. I hardly understand it. And I go to conferences, uh, the UK UUG conference in, in March last year, and I feel as though I've arrived from another planet, um, or perhaps an alternative universe. Um, and so now you're going to come with me into this alternative universe where you know, history took a different turning, and things are, look sort of similar, but there are differences. Um, and that's Pete's world from Doctor Who. Okay. So Plan 9 and Inferno, they're both operating systems. Um, they have different characteristics. The interesting thing about both of them is that they were designed from the start to be part, to allow you to build and be part of a distributed system. Um, and the idea was that you use a collection of, of specialized services to build one larger system. Since we're in the Wilkes room, I should point out that much of this was inspired by uh, uh, the Bell Labs people looking at systems like the Cambridge Distributed System and thinking that, that this would be a, 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 a good way of building a Unix-like system, um, but 
uh, rethinking a lot of the, 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 the things that had changed since Unix was first done in the late, late 60s and early 70s. Um, I mean, there's a big difference in, in sort of capability, the, the most obvious one being networking. Um, and the system is intended to, to be, uh, include security, network security at, uh, from an early stage. Uh, they wanted to be highly portable. Um, they had enough of the if-def hell that had, had, had arrived in Unix and so on. So in the alternative universe, none of that stuff exists. And instead, the labs people have gone on and they've developed something and it actually took off and people are actually using it. Um, so I don't have to justify the absence of, of this one thing or another. Um, the idea was to keep the structure quite simple. Uh, one reason was to be able to use it in experiments with different kinds of hardware and they wanted some sof system software to drive it. So th the idea is to keep it malleable and simple. Um, it's more than just a language. I mean, uh, it's particularly true of Inferno. Uh, if you compare it with, say, the Java approach, where the idea is that the language is the means for um, doing everything on this distributed system using an abstract machine to, 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 to have it running on all the nodes in the network. Some of those ideas appear here. Um, but there is this idea of there's still an operating system level um, in that environment. So the primary things in the system that you see repeated, if you've ever looked at the Plan 9 or Inferno papers, are these three things that function as the, as the primary driver for the organizations of the system. This is that the representation of all resources as file-like things. And the observation there was that Unix had this idea of you open a device, you know, device unlike some contemporary operating systems, that, uh, um, which had specialized uh, 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 operations to access each kind of device. There was one for tape, there was one for mag disk, there was one for this. Instead, there was just a name in the, in the file system. You opened it and you used the normal read and write system calls. And then this extra thing called IO control. Well, originally SGTTY and, and, and STTY and GTTY to do con specialized control operations on it. But this is the idea that, that, that the resources you had on the machine were accessible in the namespace, uh, in this hierarchical namespace, the same as, 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 as the files that were on disk. So the idea was in Plan 9 is to take all that idea and, and use it much more effectively, much more intensively to, do, to represent all resources in the system that you ever want to distribute to some other node. Um, Combined with that, there's this idea of a computable namespace. So the namespace is not uh, a directory structure that's physically stored on a disk somewhere. The namespace is a more abstract thing. It's, it's just the name of something, and then what it refers to is sort of a second stage, depending on how you've built the namespace and how, you have, uh, and, and how you've connected to, uh, things into that namespace. Um, and the idea of computable means that there are operations that actually manipulate namespaces. And the final thing is connected with the idea of distribution is the idea of having a file service protocol. Because you're representing all resources as files, you've got some way of assembling namespaces. If you have a, a protocol that will export, make the, the namespace visible on the network and accessible through the network, then you've made all your resources um, because all the resources are represented in these file-like things, all your resources are uh, distributed on the network um, without having to do anything special. So it, as a result, th so this is the set of system calls in the Plan 9 system. Um, and there, um, there aren't, you know, I've divided them into three categories here. And really, there might be one or two specialized system calls that I haven't mentioned here, but by and large, these are the ones that you use. And that's it. You know, it's not 250 of them. There's no problem about storing. And they fall into three categories. There's the, the first category is things to uh, do operations. Oh, I've sort of got the line in a slightly strange place, but first thing, uh, to manipulate files in a Unix-like way. So you've got open, read, write, close, um, create with an E. Um, you remove stats, so those are probably, you can guess what those do. Um, on the bottom, you've got the primitives that manipulate um, processes and uh, process images. And those, again, are similar to, to the Unix ones. Um, 
with a few um, uh, additions. So you've got a variant of fork to, to create a new process. You've got wait to wait for a process. Exits is like exit, but it takes a string as an exit status. Um, and exec is it replaces the process image by uh, 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 um, the contents of a file in a very Unix-like way. Then there's some extra ones that are different um, from Puma Unix. In fact, even the fork is given a different name because it functions rather differently. Uh, um, so rendezvous is a way for two processes to, to exchange, to synchronize and exchange values. Um, for, uh, that was the original primitive that was provided to allow concurrent programming. For various reasons, uh, specifically for real-time applications, uh, semaphores were, were uh, uh, applied to avoid you know, problems similar to um, uh, priority inversion, um, where you end up with a, with a uh, um, lower priority process blocking a higher priority process. So semaphores were, later, uh, were, were added, and in many cases those, those have been used to replace some of the uses of rendezvous. Um, alarm and sleep. Notify and noted is similar to Unix signals. And seg, the seg functions manipulate memory segments. And finally, there's uh, erstra, which, is, uh, which uh, uh, sets and retrieves an error string, a per-process error string, which is the, the, uh, a textual str uh, thing, similar to erno, but it's a string rather than a number. Uh, one advantage of that is that when you start looking at programs running in different environments, you don't have to have a globally unique error number mean uh, 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 that you have to maintain and, 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 and uh, uh, across a, a variety of administrative boundaries and uh, also application boundaries. And then the middle uh, 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 functions here, bind, mount, and unmount. Mount and unmount look familiar from Unix, but they actually uh, do something different. Uh, these uh, um, b bind, mount, and unmount manipulate the namespace. Um, so if you've got, think of a process running in a, in a, in a tree of names, um, then bind, uh, uh, un mount and unmount allow the process to change what those names, what names are available and what those names refer to. Um, actually, this refers to a couple of things. I'll just back up a bit and explain those a bit more clearly because I'm going to get into trouble with the next slide otherwise. Um, so the basic idea is that bind takes an existing name and puts it somewhere else in the namespace. It binds it to another point in the namespace. Um, mount takes a file descriptor, which is connected to a file server, and I'll get on shortly to as to what that means, and um, puts that in, uh, a connection to that file server into a namespace at a particular point. And unmount undoes the effects of, of, of those two previous operations. So those three are enough. You know, there are probably some interesting operators that could also be provided. But those three are enough for practical purposes to do what's needed. Um, so here are some examples of file servers. Um, you know, some kernel services so th th you know, provided in a traditional way, um, uh, uh, similar to Unix, uh, except that instead of having special files, these names are actually in a g generated on the fly, if you like. Um, uh, they're uh, um, um, pure names um, that refer to things inside the kernel. And the kernel, itself, the kernel itself generates those names. So it's probably closer to the, the sys and prox uh, stuff that, uh, in, in uh, the Linux environment. Um, and there's a sort of convention of handling things. Instead of having the IO control request, um, instead, devices that need device control tend to come in pairs. So you've got a data the read and write to do the data of it, and the kernel file associated with that does the control function. Um, that way you can have ordinary read and write requests being directed at You open the control function, uh, control file name, use ordinary read and write requests to um, control the operation of the, uh, uh, of, of the data side of things. Um, uh, what advantage of that is that, unlike, say, our control, is that you can export the pair, and then you can give a remote machine the ability to control a, dev a, dev a local device uh, without having to worry about, well, what's the bit pattern that's needed in this particular thing? What is the set of values that are associated with eye control and so on? Okay. And 
Multiplexes are represented by file trees. Um, and then there's a big collection of user services. Um, there are some fairly boring examples. Um, uh, user services that provide conventional file storage for DOS file systems, uh, um, CD file systems, and so on. Um, the interesting ones uh, are the ones that provide services. So for example, DNS um, is provided through uh, a file server. Um, there's uh, a program called the Connection Service, CS, th that provides the ability uh, uh, translation of symbolic names. I'll show an example shortly. Um, mail file system, UPASFS, um, that represents mail messages as hierarchies of, 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 of names with the contents broken out, so this, the, the from, the two lines, and so on are broken out. Um, the graphic subsystem um, is done using um, namespaces. Um, the um, and there are various functions that sort of in, in, uh, like IOSTATS, which puts itself uh, in the namespace uh, between a process and its original namespace, so you can uh, so it can track all the operations within that namespace and provide a, a little table showing um, um, how which files have been accessed and and what how, mu how much IO has been done to each of them. Uh, Factotum is uh, a sort of uh, similar to PAM, I suppose, in Unix. It's a f uh, security agent. Um, but it's the only one that knows all the security algorithms, and it, it uses the namespace, uh, uh, it acts as a file server to allow other applications to make secure connections without having access to any of the keys and so on. Uh, and there are operations that work pr on the protocols to provide caching. Um, networks are implemented as uh, hierarchies of names, so that you've got um, you know, the ARP table, the connection service, the domain name service. To translate a name, you open that, write a conventional st uh, uh, string into it, and read back a description of, of, of what the translation might be. Um, the Ethernet, if you want to know what the Ethernet address is, you just catch that file. And that's the thing, is that because it's in the namespace, it's accessible to the shell um, uh, uh, from the command line, so that you can easily wa wander about and explore the system. Very, uh, again, some of these ideas have turned up in um, Unix latterly with Sys. Originally, a lot of those things were kind of view onto things, but they weren't the real things. Whereas these are views onto the real. Th you know, there is only that in the system. Um, so these things speak directly to the device in in in, a, in a perhaps a deeper way. In that the only way to make a network call on the Ethernet is to open up one of these files and read and write it. Um, and IP interfaces are available. Um, there is actually a collect instead of having jails or um, uh, uh, yeah, separate socket subsystems, um, you simply mount a different instance of the IP stack um, to get a fresh set of names that aren't connected to anything, and then you connect them to uh, different new network interfaces by uh, opening one of these things and writing some requests into it. So here's our domain name service works. Is that you open NetDNS, you write the domain name that you want to translate into it, and it it writes back. Uh, sorry, when you read it, um, you get back a list of, of text strings that give you the various translations for IP addresses. And there's a convention for, for for doing the reverse translation and the rest of it. This also means that because NetDNS is a file server, it's an application running in its own domain in its own space. Uh, it automatically is able to cache things for all applications that use it. Furthermore, if you're on a tiny machine, you can import slash net slash DNS from another, a remote machine and do name translations using its cache and its ability to communicate with the outside world without having to run the domain name server on your local machine. Um, and oh, yeah, well, here's an example of how you can, you can translate different other kinds of requests. Um, I'm just going to run out of time, so I'm going to zip along. Um, to provide network independent, so the system doesn't assume that everything is internet. So to provide network internet independent translations, there's another service that's used by process applications instead of using DNS directly, and it translates a, a peculiar form of, of symbolic reference for a network type, um, a, a host on the network and a service. And again, so the idea is that you write it, uh, the thing you want to translate, and you read back a set of recipes, each line representing, well, if you want to get to this abstract thing, you can get to it by uh, doing this or doing this. But 
what is it? the interpretation of this is that the way you get there is you open the thing with that name that I've just given you, and you write this string preceded by the word connect into the file that you've opened, and that will give you a connection in your process, a file descriptor, to the thing that you wanted to get to there. If that doesn't work, you can try this one, and so on. Um, and I mentioned commutable, commutable namespaces. So mount connects to a file server through a file descriptor. Bind takes an existing name and puts it over another existing name, so you can remap things. It's important to note that the granularity of this is per process. Um, I mean, a group of processes can share a namespace, but in the, in the limit, a, a process can have its own private namespace with just the names it needs to work with. So the ability to use a name and what it refers to acts as a kind of capability as well. So you can jail a process by simply not building a namespace that doesn't include, say, the network devices. A lot of it depends on naming conventions. So you noticed, in, in, uh, might have noticed in the early one, there's all these use of clone files. There's a standard stru naming structure for multiplexes. There's a standing naming structure uh, for um, um, uh, the data and control file names and so on. Um, unmount. Uh, oh yes, the union mount is um, it's sort of a multiple mount really because it doesn't do the union of the entire namespace. It does a union along one dimension. So if you, un if you put a directory onto another directory, you can choose whether it goes before or after it and create a kind of search path. Um, and also p if the names are different, then you can, uh, um, then you can uh, beneath that, then you can also create a kind of uh, uh, um, collection of, of possibilities on a single point in the namespace. So that's used to replace the shell's uh, search path by simply binding the things that you want in the right order on slash bin. Slash dev is actually an empty directory when the system starts up and things are simply bound, union bound onto that. So it puts a collection of kernel devices onto it. Uh, net similarly is empty and then the interfaces are added onto it. Okay. I'm um, going to run a time. So I'll just do this next bit, which is the protocol itself. Um, uh, so the protocol is called 9P. In Inferno, it used it's sometimes called sticks, but it's now the same as 9P. There were originally some minor differences between the two. Um, it's, a, it's a file service protocol. Unlike NFS, it's, it's deliberately stateful because the things you want to talk to have state, and so it's connection-oriented. And uh, uh, there is an application, uh, I mean, a service that will provide a persistent 9P connection, you know, subject to certain constraints of what you're connecting to. Um, to recover from errors and things, but that's a separate component. Okay. Um, a fundamental thing is that, th is that from the start, user, user mode programs are intended to be act as file servers. So it's not like, I don't know, Fuse. Uh, so it's like Fuse being added to Linux later. Here it's built in from the start. Um, and you can serve 9P on any file descriptor, so it might be a network descriptor uh, uh, or a pipe. Um, and you use the mount system call to take a file descriptor and say, the thing on the other end is, is, is an IMP service. And from then on, the below the point where you attach it in the namespace, the kernel translates all the file system operations you make into 9P requests on that connection. And the protocol itself has a very simple structure. You've got um, just these operations. Um, users and groups are represented as strings not numbers, so you have much less trouble try, uh, doing uh, mapping across administrative boundaries. You still have to do something, but it's uh, considerably easy to manage. Diagnostics are also transmitted by error strings. You can use any pro uh, byte sequence protocol, so we've used it over infrared links to a Lego robot brick uh, running a specialized program that implements a simple 9P server that serves up control and data files for the servo motors and various other things on the, on the device. Um, so these, you know, this is the extent of the protocol and the implementation of the protocol. This is, um, if I explain sort of roughly what these things mean, this is actually the physical representation of the protocol as well, that you've got a four byte size, one byte with a, a particular value that represents the operation, a two byte tag that identifies a particular operation. So if you've got several read requests active at once on a particular um, 
file, then they have different tags. And, you, and several can be in flight at once. The FID corresponds roughly to an open file instance, although it doesn't have to be open because the FIDs are also used to walk through a namespace. Um, and as you see, there's a fairly close correspondence between those uh, operations and system calls. Um, there is a special mechanism in there to do authentication as well, with, um, so that the idea, again, using reads and writes, uh, if you get one of these, it gives you access to a, sp uh, to a file that is connected to an, uh, to an authenticator for the file server, uh, which in turn turns around and uses the factotum agent that I mentioned earlier. And through the combination, you end up authenticating securely access to a particular uh, part of a file tree as a particular user of that within that file server. Um, and I'll, yes, I'll stop in about a minute. Um, so let me take some questions, don't run over time. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do this one anyway, because this gets to the heart of it, which is that, so now you've got, you've got resources as files, and I've given you know, very quickly some idea that, that networks and services and so on are represented as files. You've got the 9P service, you've got the ability to make namespaces out of these things. So when you implement a distributed service, the first thing you think about is, what should the namespace look like for this service or collection of services? Um, once you've done that, you've up and, and you've implemented the file server to do it, um, you have the ability to put things together. So for example, in Plan 9, if you do network graphics, you do it by importing DevDraw. <coughs> There isn't, an extra, there isn't a, a, a special network-oriented graphics protocol. Of course, on DevDraw, the, the files inside DevDraw, there are special graphic-like operations that you do. Um, but the distribution of it is all handled by 9P. Network audio. So if you've got a machine that hasn't got an audio, you know, that has got an audio device and another one that has, then you import the audio device into your local namespace and you can use it as if it were local. The sound will come up from over there, of course. Um, and if you want a network gateway, so you've got a remote machine that's connected to the outside world and one that isn't, um, then you can import that um, slash net. And then when you make network operations, it's as if you were making them directly from that machine, because you are. Um, it's being transmitted by 9P across to that machine where it does the network operations there. That's has the advantage, so for example, at home, it turns out that my um, Virgin Media line has got an address that's in the blacklist, so I can't actually use SMTP directly to connect to anything um, to do my own outgoing mail. But it turns out that the virtual server that I've, uh, that I've got at ByteMark in York um, isn't on the blacklist, um, and so I run an Inferno instance on that machine uh, it's running a virtual Linux. I run an Inferno instance on that machine that um, presents a slash net just the same <coughs> as Plan 9's would, and I import that slash net into slash net on my home Plan 9 machine, and then I can do SMTP calls, and it's fine because it's actually that other machine that's, that's presenting the interface to the outside world. You know, sometimes there are problems of efficiency, and you begin to look more closely at ways of improving it or being able to do streaming and various other things. Nevertheless, especially when developing, this gets you yeah, a good long way without having to do anything special. In many cases, network audio is an example, network graphics, um, especially with increasing speeds of networks, things are just fine. Um, so the CPU service, which is equivalent to, um, in a way, to remote shell, is uh, done by, it connects the, uh, so we call the thing that, that connects to the CPU server, uh, the terminal, so the terminal, the C, you connect to the CPU server. Um, the CPU, you export your slash dev from the terminal or subset of the slash dev from the terminal to the CPU server, which binds, which imports the slash th that and puts it on its own slash dev. So now dev draw, dev cons, which is the equivalent of dev tty, dev cons, refers to the keyboard and the mouse and the, and the graphics device of the terminal. Um, the Windows system, uh, similarly, uh, works as a file server, so that you can do things like you can in the Windows system you can create a window CPU into that, and then every wind and then you can run the Windows system inside the window, 
And then within that window, every window you create is actually automatically on the CPU server so that in terms of the commands you execute. Because, so there's kind of a recursive structure that you can, you, you can take advantage of. So again, in the embedded space, the advantage is that you've got small devices that are you know, too tiny to do, that, to, to do something big, but you can program them 9, 9P on them so they can export their things or they can import bigger services from bigger machines. And you can put together um, qu quite interesting internet of um, useful things. Uh, internet of names. I would say internet, I was going to use internet of names as the title of the talk, but it turns out that's being used for something stupid. Um, <laughs> so, and internet of namespaces just doesn't have the same sort of ring to it. Okay. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so the, the system, uh, Plan 9 also has got a, you know, built in from the start some uh, support for concurrency. This is the sort of stuff that, was, that you know, wasn't in Unix in the first place because on a PDP-11, you were hard pressed to do yeah. s you know, too many things at once. And um, so unlike bigger mainframe operating systems at the time, it didn't really have you know, deep support for, um, let's say, um, concurrent use of shared memory. And the programming model allowed by the system includes both shared memory with the usual um, synchronization primitives, and also there's a, a, a library um, lib thread that provides CSP-like channels. Um, Inferno has its own programming language, um, if, if you like. It's a similar, you know, older, but you know, sim in terms of the languages you might know, it's similar to Go, uh, I I except uh, uh, perhaps with a, a slightly prettier syntax. <laughs> um, the okay, and, and in fact, the, 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 you know, again, compared to, to the you know, development of Unix, from the start, most of the non-trivial file servers are, con are concurrent programs. So the Windows system is concurrent. The export of FAST, which is the command that exports a file system namespace to a remote machine, is a concurrent program. Acme is a kind of funny kind of editor, similar to Wirt's uh, Oberon editor in, in sort of style and, and design. But it's actually a file server. And each text window you have on it corresponds to a, a set of, a, set of a, a little hierarchy of names. Uh, the Windows system is a file server. It serves um, uh, cons, which is the, uh, I said the equivalent of TTY, and that's the, the conventional name for the place where you get keyboard input, and, and, and it serves dev mouse. And it serves a different, so each, so each window has got cons and mouse, or point, uh, mouse or pointer in Inferno, and in, but in each window, that cons and mouse refers to that local Windows virtual console and virtual mouse. So when applications read and write that, um, the window manager turns around and multiplexes that use across the real, oh, sorry, across the cons and mouse that it got from its own slash dev. But of course, that's how you can run the window manager inside the window manager is because within the window, um, cons and mouse refer to just that localized instance and so the whole thing is recursively virtual. Oh, and uh, also important for, uh, there is real-time support in terms of, a, in the shape of, a, a, of an EDF scheduler. Um. And the, the Inferno I mentioned, it takes the Plan 9 and ideas, it does, uh, it runs as a native operating system on a variety of machines like ARM, PowerPC, x86. Similar to Plan 9, there's a list of machines that it can do. But it also runs hosted, so you can have this operating system, Plan 9-like, that runs as an application on Solaris, Mac OS X, um, Linux, um, Windows. And from the point of view of the application, written in this safe concurrent language, Limbo, um, which as I said, is sort of Go-like in terms of style, and as you've got CSP-like channels that you send and receive typed messages on, so, you know, so it's typed CSP. It's actually closer to the Pi calculus in terms of the things you can do with it. Um, but it, um, yeah, so it looks like the same Inferno operating system that appears everywhere else. That's how I can run it on my virtual server uh, on ByteMark. And it, it virtualizes some of the uh, host operating systems interfaces. So it makes the Linux socket stuff look like slash net. Um, and, or if you like, the slash net names connect down through the Unix socket. Uh, 
the Linux socket stuff, so the application doesn't have to do with socket calls, it just opens slash net and does the usual things with it. Um, and and <laughs> Inferno, even more than Plan 9, was consciously intended to be used for embedded devices. It was originally done, developed to go in an AT&T set-top box. Uh, um, and it was latterly, uh, then they went on to use it in a, uh, or a variant of it in a, um, uh, as the management section of a, of a um, an IP swi uh, telephone switch. Um, and, um, but, but Plan 9 has been used in, in embedded applications. Um, and, uh, yeah, this, uh, I will stop here actually, which is that, see the idea here is that, is that you know, these are ideas that could, if you like, come out of the alternative universe and be applied perhaps in, yeah, in the, the sort of the mainstream of, of the uh, current universe's uh, um, uh, development of Unix, uh, although you know, it's tricky to do because so much of it has to be POSIX compatible. And the moment you say POSIX compatible, that means you end up with, in C, say, lots of ifdefs and a ton of header files. Um, I mean, who knows what's in any of the header files? Well, nobody does. That's why you... That's why they're all set up so they include each other and then have to check to see whether they've included each other because nobody can remember which order they're in because there are too many of them. Uh, you know, which things are in studlib? Oh, I uh, is that stood in? Do I need stood? No. Yes, quite. Um, okay, so the idea in both systems design was to aim to be minimalist, to make a lot of use of compositions. You have yeah, a few clear mechanisms, you know, ho ideally honed to, to do things precisely, and then you compose them to, to, to build something bigger out of it, something more capable out of it, uh, something capable out of it. Um, inspiring, well, there are enough examples within the system that you start looking at uh, particular applications, uh, say, um, the example I was going to use if I hadn't run out of time, was a grid scheduler uh, to, to, ser to serve jobs up to, to uh, uh, a collection of works uh, 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 of slave uh, uh, computers that are doing computation, um, and you farm out the work. Well, this was done by you know, we, it's an actual Inferno appliance we we built, um, and that was done by thinking first about what namespace you would use to represent the scheduler, what model you would have, and then developing it by um, you know, uh, um, splitting the work up amongst three people, one of whom had used namespace to present. A graphical interface to control it. Another one who did the work on the on the worker, the client side, the computational side, to access the namespace to, to, to find out what work to do. And then finally there's the person who did the scheduler work. And by using the namespace as the as the as the uh, 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 design basis, the, the, the agreement uh, between the various components. Um, it would allow the development of each of those things to proceed independently because if you want to test the scheduler, you can just cat some files. Um, if you want to test the um, uh, graphics thing, you can just create some, synthetic, uh, some, some files and act real files, or you can just echo things into a simple file server. Um, and so on. So when we put the thing together, it, it, it worked. Um, and, and since that was the, the, the day of the demonstration, it was just as well. Um, so it's inspiring in the sense that you look for examples and you think, you look at things a little differently in terms of, uh, of how to represent these things and also in terms of how to split the problem up differently. And then looking at other applications in other operating systems and thinking, trying to do similar sorts of things. Uh, and then finally, um, you said the important thing about the thing is that, is that it's bigger on the outside. <laughs> um, so instead of having a vast thing inside this operating system, which is huge, and then you have to fuss trying to squeeze it down. Um, you start with something that's actually fairly, s it's not tiny, but it's you know, you know, reasonably compact by comparison, especially by comparison to some. You know, it's probably a tenth, you know, it's probably a fraction of the size of system D, for example. Um, the and, uh, and it hasn't got tentacles into in the entire world either. Um, and that's a result of, of being minimalist in design, but also focusing on having a few prim uh, primitives and then some uh, operators to allow you to compose those rather than trying to build everything in uh, into everything from the start. Uh, right, so I'll, I'll, s I'll stop there. Um, and are there, are there any questions?